Well, good morning. Let's stand to our feet today. We serve him, a God of the impossible who does things beyond our comprehension. So let's give him the praise and the glory and the honor that he's due today. Let's get excited about what he's doing and in through our lives as we worship him together. You are the one over it. 
today to run to the name of Jesus. We come into this place because he's worthy of our praise. There's no one do this kind of worship except for the God Almighty who reigns on high, who's creator, who's sovereign, who's holy. 
And so we come into this place to worship people. And we want to invite you this morning to do that, to run to the name of Jesus. And we're going to invite our prayer team here to the front. And some of you just need to be at this altar this morning so that we can pray with you and pray over you. Are there things going on in your life that we want to bring before our Heavenly Father? And prayer changes things. It just does. It's just a, it's something you can't comprehend the way that it works, but God does unique and beautiful and powerful things when we surrender our hearts and we surrender our lives. So I want to invite you as we continue to worship this morning, to, as we worship this amazing, amazing God to come join us and we will pray with you this morning. According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. 
by grace you have been saved. He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So let's sing this morning to our God, the one who showed us his redeeming love and all his grace. Come on. Our hope today is in the grace of Jesus. When we sing that song, we recognize that apart from his work, apart from his goodness to us, we have nothing, we are nothing. We're dead where we stand, and we stand now in his presence, fully blameless because of what he's done for us. It's all by his grace that we've been saved, and I'm so thankful he takes it a step further, and by his grace we're sustained for the moments that come in this life, the moments that hit us, that are unexpected, the mountains that stand in front of us. And by faith, we come back to him again and we beckon his grace to come. Jesus, would you come? It's only by your grace today I stand before you now. I've seen you move, I wanna see you move again in my life. I need you, Jesus. Come on, just ask him right now to come to meet you where you are. Oh, we need you, Jesus. We need you to move today, God. It's our heart's desire. I've seen you move. You've moved my mountains. And I believe I need you. I see you do it again. You made a way by your grace where there was no way. And I believe I see you do it again. I've seen you move, let your faith rise You move my mountains And I believe I'll see you do it again You made a way Where there was no way And I believe, come on, sing it out I'll see you do it again I've seen you move You move the mountains This is what you do, my You made 
your faith and praise rise to him right now. He's worthy. It's all because of you, Jesus. We praise you. We praise you, God. That's good news. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us. Y'all can have a seat. Because it's Sunday. Yeah, it's Resurrection Day. You know, you don't have to wait till Easter to celebrate the resurrection. You know that, right? That's why we meet on a Sunday. Reminds us every Sunday that Jesus came out of the grave. Game changer. But it's also a special day because this service, and only this service, we're going to dedicate some babies and some young ones right now. See, there's advantages to coming to the third service and sleeping in because the rest didn't get this, all right? That's right, third service only. So what we're doing today as a church family is we're dedicating these little ones to the Lord just so you understand what we're doing. This doesn't save them, doesn't make them a Christian. What we're doing does not impart God's grace for forgiveness of sin upon their life. The Bible teaches every individual must personally place their faith in Him to be forgiven of sin. A pastor can't do it for them, parents can't do it for them. But what these parents are doing is bringing them before the Lord formally, dedicating these little ones to the Lord. And we're gonna pray over them and pray God's blessing over them as we formally dedicate them to the Lord. So let's do that together. Yeah, let's check out these. Check, check. Let's check out these beautiful pictures on the screen as we read these names. So the Bowers today are dedicating Rowan Henry. The Bruckers are dedicating Rhett Dale. The Freemans are dedicating Everly Ann. The Gleasons are dedicating Isaiah Allen. The Millers are dedicating Nora Lee. The Parkers are dedicating Caroline Ray and Henry Thomas. Shacklefords are dedicating London Brooks. The Webbs are dedicating Olivia Grace. And the Zimmermans are dedicating Charlotte May. Let's give it up for these parents and these babies. And mamas and daddies, we want you to know as your church family that we are so proud of you. And we are so thankful that there are still godly mamas and daddies in the world. Amen? They want to raise their children to know and love Jesus, the true and living God. But it's hard work. And we need God's help as moms and dads to work of grace in our life. And so as your church family, we want you to know we love you. We support you fully. We want to partner with you to raise your children to know and love the Lord. So I'm going to pray right now. Church, would you bow with me? God, we do thank you for godly families in these days where it just seems like there's more and more things in our world pulling families apart, drifting farther and farther from you. God, we are thankful for these men and women who bring these children before you now. And God, we pray blessing over each of them. We ask God that you would bless these families, that God, you'd bless these moms and dads with wisdom. Uh, Lord, that they would be blessed from above with a a courage to grow their children to know and love you and that Jesus you'd give these children I pray a faith early in life that they would come to know you early as Lord and Savior that you would use each of these little ones to impact eternity that they would grow up to themselves have godly families that you would prosper them and bless them all the days of their life that your grace God would fill these families on a daily basis and we pray it together in Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen. We love you all very much. God bless you guys. All right. How awesome is that, guys? We got babies everywhere. Amen. Well, my name is Jason, and I work here on staff at Abundant Life. I work with our groups ministry and our missions ministry. I want to give a quick shout out to everyone watching online. Thank you for being here for our Independence Campus and for Blue Springs. Today is the day that the Lord has made, amen? Amen. Well, before we get started, I have a couple of announcements for us. Number one, please and thank you for wearing your mask, even at your seat, that would really help us out. Second, we have something called a Next Steps card that should be on the seat back and the seat in front of you. If you wanna take that out and fill that out, all of us have a next step in our faith journey and we wanna help you make yours today. If you're a first time visitor, we also would like to give you a gift. So again, if you wanna fill that card out and then turn it in at the Next Steps desk in the lobby, or you can go to livingproof.co bash next steps. Church, what if I told you 
that 40% of the world's population has no access to the gospel. People live and die in countries like Somalia and never even get the chance to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, this is the reality, but here's what's cool. God, even though we can't go to Somalia right now, God is bringing Somalians and people like them to our city. So for the first time in their lives, they have the potential to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. But if we don't tell them, it's just like they're living in Somalia. And so for the first time ever, Abundant Life has come up with something brand new. It's called Local Serve Team. And what a local serve team is, is a team of people that are committed to making global disciples right here in our city. We wanna reach our neighbors and the nations at the same time. So our very first local serve team event is gonna happen May 28th through the 30th, Memorial Day weekend. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna <laughs> invade the city in a good way. And we're gonna have eight different projects going on, serving five different people groups in our city. And many of them are just like the Somalian country that have no access to the gospel, but here they do. And so we would love for you to help us go global and local at the same time. You can find out more information out in our lobby, or you can sign up again at livingproof.co backslash global. Finally, uh, generosity is a core value of our church at Abundant Life. We wanna, thank, we wanna give back what God has entrusted us. And because of y'all's generosity, church, we are able to fund the translation and the recording of a brand new Bible in another language that's never been recorded before. So very exciting. Yeah, you bet. The Old Chamas people are a tribe in Kenya, Africa, that until today have had no access to the gospel in written form or in oral form. They're a story culture. And so we've partnered with an organization called Faith Comes Through Hearing, or Faith Comes By Hearing, excuse me. And that's exactly what we're praying that would happen, that when the Old Chamas people hear the gospel in their language for the first time, that they would put their faith in Jesus Christ. There's a couple ways that we can continue to give. You can text, you can give online, or you can give in person, but thank you for your generosity. Let me pray for us and we'll get going. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the people in this room. I thank you for all the things you're doing all over the world. I thank you for what you're doing in our city. I thank you for what you're doing in this church. God, I pray that you would open our hearts and prepare our minds to hear from you today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. <laughs> Good morning, Lee Summit, Blue Springs, Independence, all of you watching online, welcome. We're in a series in the book of Mark, going verse by verse, uh, at least I should say doing, I, I normally like doing verse by verse, but we're doing kind of the highlight reel, kind of a flyover, seven weeks in the book of Mark with a global movement of hundreds of churches preaching through this gospel culminating on Resurrection Weekend. So it's exciting to move as a body of Christ beyond the walls of our church. I've, I've heard it said before that we're living in a time without any heroes. Where'd all the heroes go? I want to do this right now. Everybody do this. Look around. Turn left. Look left. You should not be looking at me right now. All right? I'm serious. Good look. And, and do like this. Okay, you should not be looking at me. All right? I'm looking at you. You shouldn't be looking at me. Everybody do like this. Do you see him everywhere? There are heroes everywhere, church. There really are heroes in our church, kingdom heroes, what I call heaven's hidden heroes, heroes that only God sees, but heroes nonetheless. One of those heroes is this lady right here. Her name is Beth, and she was a single mom having successfully raised her two children by herself into young adulthood, and a few years ago, God began to lay it on her heart to adopt a child. And she adopted this little boy right here, Davion, when he was only five years of age. He became 
her son, a member of her family. Davion, tragically, was burned very, very badly, over 25% of his body with third-degree burns when he was only four months of age. A candle somehow got knocked over into his bassinet, completely torched the entire apartment building, and miraculously, somehow, Davion survived. He was flown from Raymore, Missouri, to Cincinnati, Ohio, to Shriners Hospital, where he fought for his life for the next four months. And after 15 surgeries and over 2,500 days in the foster care system, Beth adopted Davion to become her son. He's now eight years of age. They'd be here today, but he's having yet another surgery in Dayton, Ohio, having more skin grafts. Davion, we want you to know we're so proud of you. You are a courageous, courageous young man. And God has promised to do something special with your life. And Beth, you're a hero. This is the stuff heroics are made of in the eyes of God. Uh, let me introduce you to some other kingdom heroes sitting right down here, Jay and Tammy Cherry. And this is the stuff heroics are made of in the kingdom of God. So Jay and Tammy in 2012 were in a season of life where they're looking to retire. In that season of life where a lot of couples are looking to maybe move south into a warmer climate and follow little white balls around little manicured lawns for the rest of their life or maybe collect seashells by the seashore, not them. No, no. They were thinking about how they can use the rest of their life for the mission, for the kingdom of God, to advance this mission of redemption. They'd gone on a mission trip to Ghana, Africa, where they'd served in an orphanage. And they felt like maybe God was calling them to go back and live their full time in Ghana to serve in this orphanage. And when they got back, they're, you know, making plans and going to sell our stuff so we can go back to the mission field. Little did they know the mission field was coming to them. And it came on the other end of a phone call with DFS, Division of Family Services. Little did they know that they had a little great niece that had recently been born. Uh, little Allie, 1.9 pounds, born to their nephew and his girlfriend. Unfortunately, both of them incarcerated, uh, deeply addicted to drugs. So Allie's born with her little body addicted to drugs already, and they really weren't sure of her future, her health. Her eyes were in doubt. Could she ever see correctly? Her heart was in doubt. Uh, and they were looking for kind of the next akin to see if you know they could foster them. And so they did. They took Callie into their home, and she was just a baby and nurtured her two years later. They adopted her into their family and great uncle and great aunt became mama and daddy. <laughs> Guys, you, you're heroes to God. This is what heroes are made of. Don't tell me there's no heroes left in the world. And so in 2018, little Callie came to know Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And she was Allie. They added a C. She became Callie. The C stands for Christ. And today, Callie, you are a beautiful, beautiful little butterfly that loves Jesus. You are so special. And you have a very special mama and daddy too. God has great plans for your life to use you in a very special way in the days ahead. This is hero stuff, y'all. We don't have to make up heroes. You don't have to go to the movies to watch make-believe heroes. There are heroes everywhere you look, all around us, in the eyes of God. This is heroic. Ryan and Megan McGoy actually lead our foster or adoptive ministry. They're an adoptive family. They have three biological children. They have three children that are adopted. Actually, two have been adopted, and they're in the process of adopting another, and they lead this ministry in our church. If you want to know more about this. Maybe God would lay it on your heart to perhaps foster or adopt. You can email them at aladoptionministry at gmail.com. Ryan and Megan, I'm so thankful for your leadership because adoption is near to the heart of God. As a matter of fact, adoption is a picture of the gospel. Did you know that we all are orphaned spiritually? We come into this world born physically, yet we've been orphaned spiritually because of sin's penalty, estranged from God's family because God is holy. 
And that is why it says this in Ephesians 1, 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. You see, God uses this adoption imagery to illustrate our relationship now as God's children. We were estranged from God because of our sin, and he is holy. There was separation, like we had no family, yet Jesus paid the price. He paid the penalty so we could be adopted back in to God's family. Isn't that exciting? And you can see why adoption then is such an amazing picture, the imagery of what God has done for us. And so many of our families are living out that imagery every single day as they foster children who have no home or perhaps adopt children into their own family. It's really, really amazing. This is the stuff heroics are made of if you're a part of the kingdom of God. Now, why do I tell you that? Because in Mark chapter three, Jesus is choosing members of his family. There's the power of being chosen. Uh, In Mark chapter three, he's choosing his disciples. He's chosen the 12. And you understand, he didn't just choose the 12 disciples to be his only disciples. We're all called to be his disciples. That's the mission of the church, to go make disciples. And did you know, as a disciple of the Son of God, you're also then a child of God, and you're a full member of the family of God. And that is what is happening now in Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus is choosing his family. Jesus has chosen each of us to be his family. Now what's happening in Mark chapter 3 is that Jesus has basically been rejected by his family. Uh, He's been estranged from his family. We're told in scripture even his own brothers did not believe that he could really be the Messiah, that he could really be God. In fact, not, not just his family, but his hometown. I'm talking his home city. They have rejected him like, you are crazy. Now put yourself historically in this situation. Because it might be easy for you to believe, looking back historically, that Jesus is the Messiah. He came out of the grave after all. But if you were raised as a sibling of Jesus in this home, this would have been a stretch for you too. His brothers don't believe their big brother is the Messiah, really. The anointed one, the promised one, you're really God's son. And think about it, anywhere in any home, there's sibling rivalry. All right, I, I was raised in a home with you know, several siblings, sisters, brothers. Uh, I have a brother that's a year younger than me today. I mean, he's one of the greatest men I know. I deeply respect, admire my brother. Uh, there's that mutual love and respect we have now as grown men. But growing up, I'm just being honest, we had a love-hate relationship. We did. I mean, there's that sibling rivalry that always takes place. So think about that same sibling rivalry with Jesus and his brothers. I know what it was like growing up in my home with my brothers and my sisters. You know, you'd be kind of in the middle of something and you'd be like, oh, you think you're so perfect. Now imagine saying that to your brother, Jesus. (laughs) Well, yeah, I am. Only it would be true. Imagine, you are literally related to the perfect brother. I mean, that's kind of a heavy cross to bear, isn't it? Think about that. Or how about this one? You are always mom's favorite. And if you're Jesus, guess what? You are always mom's favorite. So you can see why this is kind of a stretch. He has his coming out party at his baptism. He announces that he is the promised one. He is the Messiah. He's been going about all of Galilee doing these amazing miracles to prove he really is God who's now become a man. Eventually, he's going to be our sacrificial lamb. You can start to see why his brothers didn't believe. Like, this was too much. Like, you're God? I mean, really? And I want you to see that what's happening now in Mark chapter 3 is they've come now to Jesus. Probably, you know, there's this kind of family dispute and Mary, his mom, has kind of brought his brothers along and they're probably going to say, we're sorry and, you know, will you come back into the family? And Mark chapter 3 then puts it this way. Look at what it says in verse 31. Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside, they sent to him calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle. I want you to notice Jesus always had a circle. At Abundant Life, we're all about circles. Jesus ministered to the crowds. 
I mean, the enormous circles, yet you always see Jesus with an inner circle, a smaller circle. We want you to have a circle at Abundant Life. If you'll sign up for the next group, Connect, we will help you find a circle. Every one of us needs a circle in the middle of this great big crowd. And I want you to see this is what is happening. Jesus has kind of now gotten away from the big crowd. He's in the circle. And I want you to see what he says to them as he, as he, as, as he circle at those who sat about him. And he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus begins redefining what does it mean to be simply a disciple of Jesus. Disciple means learner. Disciple means follower. But that's kind of formal. He's now redefining what that really means. To be a disciple of the Son of God, you are now adopted into the family of God. He's saying, listen, whoever does the will of God, you are part of the family of God. You are my brother and you are my sister. And that is what it is now as the body of Christ. We are indeed the family of God. We have one father. We have one spirit. We have together one family. And that makes us brothers and sisters. You know, growing up in church, depending on your denomination, your tradition, where I came from, everybody, we don't do this as much today, you don't hear it as much today, but everybody where I came from was brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. Uh, and you don't hear it much today, you hear it a little bit, kind of a generational thing or perhaps a denominational thing. Every once in a while somebody say, Brother Phil. Nobody calls me Brother Phil, but once in a while somebody calls me Brother Phil. You can call me brother if you want to, just don't call me reverend. Uh, I, I remember the first time, 21 years ago, I go to a bed of cop, wake up a pastor, do, come to my first funeral, I'm going to do my first funeral, and I hear the funeral director behind me say, hey, Reverend, I had to look around. I did not know who he was talking to. Like, me? Reverend? Reverend's so formal. You can call me brother because we're family. You understand what I'm saying? This is what Jesus is teaching. Uh, we're family. That's what he desires. And check this out. I'm going to show you two stories and in these stories, Mark chapter 3 and Mark chapter 5, what you see is Jesus choosing them, and that's what he's doing here. He's choosing his disciples. He is choosing his family. But in this next story, you see somebody else choose him. And there's the power of being chosen to be wanted. And I'm telling you this because I'm convinced every single one of the times has this orphan complex, this orphan complex that says, is there any way God would really want me? Is there any way God could really accept me? And I want you to know that God has chosen you specifically to be a member of his family. And there's this big theological debate on what's it mean to be one of the chosen, right? There's this big divide that theologians have argued for centuries over what's that mean to be chosen. This is the language of the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, you see this concept of being chosen and predestination, and there's this doctrine of election, and I'm not going to do the theological explanation today. I've done that. If you want to know more about that, we did a series out of Ephesians. You can get on our sermon page, and the series out of Ephesians 1 was called Gotcha, and it's in that series, and that sermon specifically where I explain theologically the implications of these deep, heavy concepts of, you know, being one of the chosen and the doctrine of election and, and predestination. I'm not going there today. I don't have time, but I do want you to understand that you have been chosen by God. Now, the question is, does God choose us or do we choose him? And the answer is yes. There's the answer. Because you see, there's always God's part, and then there's always our part. And you see in Mark chapter 3, Jesus is the one doing the choosing, but in Mark chapter 5, it's somebody else doing the choosing. In this first story, you have Jesus choosing them, and in the second story, you have somebody else choosing him. And I want you to see that ultimately God has chosen you to be a part of his family. Now the question is, will you choose him too? See, God has made his move. The question is, are you going to make your move? 
And what is happening here then is Jesus is redefining now that relationship we're going to have with him. Brothers, sisters, one father, members now of one family. And I want you to see that you don't have to wonder if your life is an accident. There's so many people, I think, walking around with this orphan complex wondering, why am I here? Why am I on this earth? I wonder if my life is really an accident. I want you to know your life is one of providence. It is not accidental. It is providential. Do you understand the statistical probability would lead one statistically to deduce that your life was done miraculously, supernaturally, or you wouldn't even be here today? It's a miracle, a statistical miracle. Any of us are here today. See, God has ordained that you would be here today. He's ordained that you would have life or you would not have ever even had life. Think about this. Think about the miracle of your life. If you go back just five generations, just five, you have 64 grandparents. Go back five generations, you have 64 grandmas and grandpas. Now, take that back 10 generations. Take it back 20 generations. Take it back 200 generations. And do you realize you have thousands and thousands of grandmas and grandpas in your family tree? And if just one of your grandmas had not met your grandpa, you wouldn't be here today. Think about the number of near misses in your family tree you don't even know about. Like I tell my three kids that are now young adults, guys, do you understand you were two houses away from never even being born? You were two houses away from never even existing. You see, my wife moved from Lakewood, Colorado when she was a freshman in high school, and she happened to move into a house that was exactly two houses inside the line of Hickman Mills School District. She actually lived closer to Grandview High School. We were two houses away from never meeting. Children, you were two houses away from never existing. I mean, think about the near miss. Two houses away. My children would have never been here because I'd have never met Krista. Not, not, not only that, think about this. Uh, not only was she two houses in the Hickman Mill School District, but we happened, just happened coincidentally, to have homeroom together our senior year. It was English. I was an H, she was an L. It was providential. Ah! <laughs> Prettiest girl in school sitting right behind me. I didn't learn a lot of English that year, but I was turned around a lot, <laughs> practicing my English. <laughs> Completely providential, not accidental. Think about this for a moment. You think your life is an accident? No, it's ordained by God. Think about this for just a moment, assuming your mommy and daddy did meet each other against all odds. Do you understand how a baby is conceived? Now, it's not a stork, and I'm not going into great details. Relax. But you remember eighth grade biology. You remember seeing the video, I know. Let's just call it the seeds. The man has the seed, the woman carries the egg. One seed is going to conceive with that egg. But did you know the man has tens of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of those little seeds, and they're all racing upstream <laughs> to be the one to get to the egg, it's a race. And what are the odds that that little seed of which was you, out of those thousands and thousands in this race, you were the one? Do you understand it's a miracle of the tens and thousands of possibilities? You were the one, do you think that's accidental? I'm telling you, it is a statistical impossibility that you were ever born. Listen, statistics is a modern science. And did you know the modern science of probability has deduced that there are mathematical impossibilities. Anything in one in 10 to the 50th power, anything over that is a mathematical statistical impossibility. Listen, your life wasn't just an improbability, it was an impossibility. I'm trying to tell you, you were conceived miraculously. God ordained your life. That is how much he loves you. That is how much he specifically meant for you to be here at this place, in this space, at this time in history. 
And that is why the psalmist would say this. Look at this, Psalm 139, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. He's saying, you, you, you were the one that put me together in my mother's womb when that one little egg met that one little seed of all the possibilities. You put me together. That's what the psalmist is now saying. Look what he says here. Your eyes saw my substance yet being unformed. You know what that's saying? He's saying, even when you were in your mother's womb and you did not have a fully formed human body, God saw you as fully human already even before you had a fully formed human body. Do you understand this is the abomination of abortion? See, abortion is an abomination to God because God has ordained that life in that womb. He has specifically put that seed with that egg at the right time, at the specific right time, and abortion snuffs out the life that God has ordained. Listen, if our federal government would spend as much federal tax dollars helping people adopt as they do aborting, What a world it would be, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. If we were as committed to helping people in adoption as we are, snuffing out babies with abortion, use that same money, think about the possibilities. Somebody told me recently, going through the middle of a domestic adoption, it takes on average $40,000 to adopt a child. You talk about a high price. Hmm. Now look at what he goes on. Check this out. He says, and in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. Do you understand that you have a biography? That you are famous in heaven. He says, listen, there is a book in heaven. You have written my book. You have written my biography already, even before I had life. And in that book, all the days of my life were explained. All the days of my life were fashioned even before those days had come to pass on earth. You have a biography and God is your biographer. He has written about your life already in heaven. Do you understand the goal of life is one day standing before God at the judgment seat of Christ and it's there that you'll get to see whether or not you lived here, everything he'd already written about you there in the book, in your biography. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. At the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to reward you accordingly. At the judgment seat of Christ, listen, you're gonna be judged not for your sin as a child of God because it's already been judged by him. It was all placed on him, on the cross of Calvary. No, you will not be judged for your sin, but you're gonna be judged for your service to him and whether or not you live for him. And he's gonna open that book that he'd written about you in heaven and he's gonna see what you did on earth and to the degree what he wrote about you there, you fulfilled here, he's going to reward you accordingly. I want you to see your life is not accidental. It has been ordained by God. Is it you choosing him or is he choosing you? Yes. He said yes to you. Now will you say yes to him? That's what we call the next steps. Just keep saying yes. Yes again. Yes again. Keep following him. Remember what Jesus said? They that do the will of God is my brother, my sister. Just keep saying yes. Living in obedience to him. And you will be a part of his family eternally because of what Jesus did at Calvary. And you've already got a biography. I want you to see something. Your life isn't an accident. There may be accidental parents, but there are no accidental babies. I have a brother 10 years younger than me. I was 10 when he was born. I remember even as a little boy, 10-year-old, going to church, my parents sharing with their friends that they're now expecting and hearing them say, oh, he's your little surprise, isn't he? Surprise parents, yes. Surprise God, no. See, every life is ordained by God. Your life was ordained by God. You have a specific purpose. God has a specific plan for your life. He's already written about it in heaven. Now, I want you to see, as adopted members of God's family, we are related by blood. This is what is unique about our adoption. Most of the time, when people adopt someone into their family, they're adopted by love and a member of that family because of love, but not related by blood. But in this case, we are adopted by love and yet we're still related by blood. I'm talking about the blood of Christ. 
adopted by love and still related by blood. And I want you to see where first Jesus was choosing them. Now we're going to talk about a story where someone chooses him. Mark chapter 5. Uh, remember, this is a survey. I normally want to do one section at a time, all right? But this is more of a flyover, all right? This is stretching me personally. Because I want to slow down and just go, whoa. But I can't because I got to do like three chapters at a time. So I'm trying. Mark chapter 5. We just, we just skip Mark chapter 4. It's a great chapter. I hope you're reading it. Yeah, I hope you're doing the listening plan. There's so much there I wish you could talk about. But I want to talk about a story, a very famous story. It's a story of Jesus healing this woman with an issue of blood, a sickness of blood. Jesus heals a woman that has been bleeding for 12 years. You can imagine how debilitating. And this is the story that brought revival to the Quechuan people of Bolivia. These are the Quechuan people, the Quechuan tribe of Bolivia. And a missionary by the name of Morgan Jackson, uh, with faith comes by hearing, took the New Testament, took the gospel to these people in Bolivia a number of years ago. By the way, faith comes by hearing is who we're partnering with, and we're taking the New Testament for the first time to this tribe in Kenya. This is what faith comes by hearing has been doing for years and years. This organization, faith comes by hearing, is actually the organization behind this 1KC movement that we're now doing. And actually, it's not just a citywide movement. It's a global-wide movement of hundreds of churches in dozens of cities all over the world preaching through the book of Mark at the same time. Well, that's the organization behind it. Faith comes by hearing. And it's an organization that translates the word of God into the spoken tongue of various people throughout the world that does not have the word of God in their spoken language. Well, in this case, the Quechuans, uh, they don't have a written language. They're a story culture. It's all verbal. And so instead of translating the Bible into their language, they recorded it in their language, and they began letting them listen to it. And Morgan Jackson tells the story that this story that we're about to study is what brought revival and redemption to this tribe. This tribe was in a state of implosion because of alcoholism. This tribe was in a state of implosion with the next generation because of fatherlessness and and, uh, poverty. And what happened was when they heard the story that we're about to study, their hearts were so gripped by the God that we know, Jesus, the Son of God, that revival broke out in this tribe and many, many, many were coming to faith in Christ and Jesus was setting them free from alcoholism and the breakdown of the family. And when they would hear the story that was healed, this woman with the issue of blood, he said they would grip their chest and they would hold their chest and they would begin to weep and they'd begin to say, my chest hurts My heart hurts, my heart hurts. Tell me the story again, let me hear it again. What was it about this story that so gripped the Quechuan people? Let's find out right now. It says this in Mark 5, 24. So Jesus went with him, Jairus, the the priest of the synagogue has come to get Jesus because his little girl is dying. He said, will you come? I know you can heal my little girl. So they're on the way now to this priest's house to heal this little girl. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, that's not a word we use a lot today. What is a throng of people? It is a closely, densely packed crowd of people. Jesus at the height of his popularity because he's healing people everywhere, right? And so crowds would follow him and, and kind of close in on him and just want to be near him. That's the scenario. That's the situation. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in a crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed 
of your affliction. Now to understand what's so gripped the Quechuan people with this story, you have to understand historically and culturally what's going on with this woman. This woman has uh, the female issue that still happens today. A woman premenopausal or going through menopause sometimes begins having her monthly menstruation and never stops. She keeps bleeding. And in these days, you have a hysterectomy. In these days of modern science, modern medicine. But in the ancient days, there was no hysterectomy. If this happened to a woman in these days, you can imagine how debilitating it would be. And for 12 years, she has struggled with this issue. And you need to understand, in Jesus' culture, they lived by what was called the Mosaic Law, the political law. You can read about it in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And by Levitical law, a woman during her time of menstruation, uh, God kind of gave her a time out from all the family obligations. She was said to be unclean. Specifically, the blood was unclean. And what was God doing? You need to understand historically and practically why some of this is in the Levitical law, because it's kind of crazy sounding to all of us as modern men and women. But God was doing two things. Practically, And then he was doing a second thing, specifically theologically, foreshadowing something. So practically, historically, God would say during that time of monthly menstruation, a woman was unclean. Not that she was a sinner, but she was to stay in one place and she would be relieved from her daily obligations. In the ancient days, women worked very hard. Physically, it was very taxing. A woman would be responsible for drawing water for her family, for example, and carrying it all back to the house and doing all you know the cooking and the cleaning, very physically demanding. And so what was God doing? Historically, he was saying, guys, I'm gonna give mama a break. All right, she needs a break. Ladies, how many of you would like to have a break? Yeah. All right, leave mama alone. Give her some space. All right, that's part of what's going on. And then practically, historically, there was also an element of personal hygiene. Not as much was known back then about how diseases are spread and blood has always carried disease and communicable diseases have always come through blood. So God said anything that blood touches is unclean. Uh, And so a lot of it was for personal hygiene and health. But then there's another component theologically. God was foreshadowing something. And I'm going to share what that something is in just a moment. Because I told you, every time Jesus healed someone physically, it was a picture of what he would do in her life spiritually. So while that law was given for that woman to bless her and help her historically, to give her a time out from all the hard responsibilities, by the time of Christ, the Pharisees had so distorted the meaning that when they said this woman is unclean, what they meant is she's a sinner. She's an unclean person, and that's never what God intended, yet that's what it had become. So consequently, here is a woman that had been ostracized by society, ostracized by her family. Anything she touched was considered unclean. She could not go to the synagogue and worship. She, in essence, had been ostracized from God, yet she knew Jesus was the answer, that Jesus can heal me, that Jesus can stop my bleeding. And so here you have this crowd, this throng. I'm talking about a densely packed group of people. And she knows, I got to get to Jesus. And somehow, probably on her hands and knees, she crawls through the crowd, wiggling through all the ankles and all the knees, finally gets near Jesus, sees him walking by, and she probably lunges just to touch his garment as he's walking by. And instantly she realizes, I'm healed. I feel different. I mean, this affliction is over, and she's probably having this little celebration, and she did not know that it had only just begun. All of a sudden, Jesus stops. What's amazing to me, listen, Jesus ministered to crowds, throngs of people, yet he always had time for the one. He always had time to stop and turn around and minister to the one. Listen, 1,100 of us are looking for the one. That one person God will lead us to that needs to find the one. I'm talking about the son. And the reason some of us don't find the one is we just don't have time to find the one. We're too busy to find the one. I want you to notice in the middle of this great crowd, Jesus was on a mission. He had a specific destination. He still had time to turn around and minister to the one. All of a sudden, Jesus turns around. She wasn't expecting that. And he calls her out. Who touched me? Now listen, he's the son of God. He knows who touched her. He knows everything. But Jesus wanted her 
to stand up and speak up. You see, he always calls us out, come out of hiding so there can become some healing. This is what Jesus does. So calls her out, who touched me? She fesses up, it was me, and she was scared, petrified. You know why? Because she had been taught that she is unclean, and anything she touches is also then unclean, and she has just touched the Son of God. She has just touched the Holy One and the Sinless One. Here she's been taught she is sinful and she is unclean and she is so unclean that God could never love her, God could never accept her and all of a sudden the sinful one has touched the sinless one and she was petrified. She thought for sure she was undone, that they were gonna stone her and drag her outside of town and leave her for dead. She was full of fear and trepidation because she didn't think there's any way the Son of God could accept her and love her. And this is why the Quechuan people were so moved by this story, because as Jesus turned around, he did not meet her with anger. See, they thought in this story that he'd look at her and go, don't you touch me. What are you touching me for? Who do you think you are? I'm God. I'm the Son of God. You're too dirty to touch me. The Kachun people were so, according to Morgan Jackson, moved by this story. You know why? Because the Kachun people had been ostracized by their country. They had been ostracized by Bolivian society. As a matter of fact, it was not until 1965 that they were formally recognized by the Bolivian government as fully human. They had been taught and treated like they were subhuman, that they were not fully human. Consequently, they were considered the untouchables, the unclean people that had been ostracized by society, thrown out, cast away. And in this story, because they're an oral story, they're an oral culture, they have no written language, they would put themselves in the story. You see, they became the woman in the story. And what they thought was going to happen is Jesus was going to turn around and say, get away from from me. Don't touch me. You're unclean. I'm clean. But when they saw the compassion of Jesus and he did not treat her with anger or belittle her, but rather called her a daughter, all of a sudden they realized maybe we too can be accepted by God. Maybe we too can be accepted and have a family. You see, no longer am I unclean, but rather God calls me worthy. And they were moved to the point of tears over and over again, their heart so gripped by this story. Can you imagine this woman? She has not been touched by human hands in 12 years. She has not physically touched another human being for 12 years. She's been taught that she is unclean, that she is not worthy. And all of a sudden, the Son of God calls her a daughter. I choose you to be my family because you made your move and you chose me too. And some of us here, listen, I'm telling you, we need this, you know why? Because some of us here wonder, am I so unclean that I can never be a member of God's family? I mean, if God is so holy and I am so not, how could he ever accept me as a member of his family? Some of us here are bleeding Our lives are bleeding. And do you understand that Jesus has the power to stop the bleeding? Our marriages are bleeding. Our families are bleeding. And Jesus has the power to stop the bleeding. Listen, we live in a world that is bleeding. We live in a society that is bleeding. The animosity, the hostility, the enmity, the anger, the sin, the division, the dissension. We live in a world that is bleeding out. But Jesus has the power to stop the bleeding. And what he did for this woman, he can do for you too. If only you'll reach out to him. He'll turn around. He'll stop. He'll reach out to you too.
Now listen, there's a practical application. Now we're going to take a little deeper dive very quickly, and we're going to go into the theological implications because for me, this is kind of the stuff I get geeky and nerdy over, okay? The, the amazing fingerprint of God all over Scripture. I told you the Levitical law had a practical reason, had theological reasons. God was teaching through foreshadows and pictures something he would do. And every single time Jesus would heal someone physically, it was a picture of what Jesus will do in our life spiritually. Listen very carefully. Carefully. Like this woman with a sickness of blood, we all are born with a sickness of blood. Our bodies are under the curse of sin. Did you know that we all have the sickness of blood? That God never intended for you to have a body with any blood. The fact that you have a body with blood and your body depends on this blood for life is a reminder that these bodies are under the curse of Adam's sin, that one day these bodies will die and return to dust. Did you know that Adam, who was the father of us all in Genesis chapter three, had a body and when he sinned, he died spiritually and his body instantly changed so that now he had a body like you and me. It was no longer a body that would live immortally, but rather it was a mortal body that one day would die under sin's penalty. And the fact that you have a body with blood is is a reminder that we have bodies that one day are under Adam's curse and will die physically. And this, you see, is the reason the Apostle Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at what he says. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is articulating that we have a body today under sin's penalty. He calls it a body of corruption because one day it will die. But he's also telling us because Jesus rose from the dead that one day we will all rise from the dead. Only the body that goes in the grave, it is different than the body that comes out of the grave. The body that goes in the grave is corruptible. The body that comes out of the grave is incorruptible. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, there are bodies that are celestial and bodies that are terrestrial. In other words, there are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. Earthly bodies are flesh and blood bodies. Bodies prone to corruption, but one day, did you know as a child of God, you're gonna have the body of the resurrected, glorified Christ that will live forever, that'll never grow old or get sick or die. A body of incorruption that Jesus one day is gonna open every grave of every believer and the body that comes out is gonna be different than the body that goes in. And like Jesus after the resurrection, you'll have a body, it's not a metaphysical existence. He had a real body. Uh, he was seen by over 500 people for 40 days and he had a body that did biological things like eating with his disciples, only he had a body that had no blood. You know why? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Last week, we looked at the story of Jesus cleansing the leper. You see, sin has affected the flesh and the blood. Leprosy in the Bible is a picture of sin. Leprosy attacked the flesh. Now he heals a woman with a sickness of blood. And I want you to see, remember this? He said to doubting Thomas, Thomas that could not fathom that Jesus had rose from the dead. What did he say? He said, reach your hands and feel the scars in my hands. And then he said, reach your hand into my side where that Roman spear pierced my side. Now check this out. He didn't say, feel my side. He said, reach your hand into my side. And Thomas did. And when he pulled his hand out, there was no blood. You know why? Because flesh and blood is mortal but one day we'll have bodies that are not flesh and blood. And the reason Jesus had to shed his blood is Leviticus 17, 11, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. You were meant to have a body that did not depend on blood to have life. Now that you have a fallen body, you've got blood that gives life to that body. And this is why Jesus had to die, but he had to do more than die. He had to shed his blood. Yes, he died for our sin, but it wasn't enough that he died for our sin. He had to shed his blood for our sin because the life of the flesh is in the blood. He shed his blood to heal us and cleanse us from our sickness of blood. And now you know why. Ephesians 1 and verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. 
the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. But that's not the end of the story. God's purpose for your life, remember, it's not accidental, it's providential. It is more than just make you a member of his family. It is more so that you can just live happily ever after. No, remember that book, that biography he wrote about you before you were even born? No, that's now your purpose. This is the reason God put you here. God has destined you, chosen you, to not live a futile life, a life of futility, but rather a life lived fruitfully, a life of bounty and beauty for eternity. You see, this is the real reason he's given us life, that we would not only be a part of his family, that we would bear fruit eternally. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. You know what Jesus is teaching? In that biography, he's ordained from eternity certain things that you would do in time that would forever impact eternity. We're all gonna bear fruit. He says you can give your life to things that don't last and don't matter. You can bear fruit temporarily. But if you wanna bear fruit that lasts eternally, fruit that remains, you have to give your life to the things that last forever. And if you're not giving your life to the word of God to invest it in the souls of men, you're giving your life to things that will not last, that will not matter. Only two things in this world last forever, the word of God and the souls of men. And unless you're giving your life to those two things, you will have lived a life that might have been fruitful, but that fruit will not remain. I love fruit. I eat a lot of fruit. I love bananas. The problem is I'm the only member of my family that loves bananas. So I have a way of overbuying, overpurchasing, like I will buy a bunch of bananas and I'm the only one eating them. I can't eat them fast enough. What happens to a banana that stays too long? Yeah, it doesn't remain. It begins to rot, begins to decay. I like yellow bananas, not brown. Amen? That's the nature of our life. That fruit will decay. If it's not eternal, it will one day fade away. I'm doing something, church, called 75 Hard. I'm doing this with uh, Sean Struckmeyer, okay? I'm on day five of 75. Our 75 Hard, work out twice a day, 45 minutes a day. One has to be outside, read 10 pages of the book of your choosing, drink a gallon of water, that's the hard part. And then the next thing is you gotta change your diet. In my case, I've chosen to cut out sugar no desserts. So I'm getting my sugar from fruit. And I'm getting my sugar from my wife. <laughs> Seriously, I've asked Chris to learn how to make fruit smoothies. So I'm getting my sugar from my wife and the fruit, okay? Here's my point, I, I am challenging my body to do something it's never done before. No ice cream for 75 days in a row. There it is. I'm challenging our body to do something it's never done before. To go on a global serve team trip without even leaving our city. Listen, there was a time you had to get on a plane and fly to the nations to fulfill the Great Commission. Go you therefore, make disciples of all nations. But we live at a time where the nations are coming to us. The nations are our neighbors. COVID can't stop the move of God. We're not calling a time out till all the mandates are over. No, we're going forward. And there are hidden heroes everywhere in our church that make it happen. And I want you to see, we have an opportunity, this is what we're doing, May the 28th through Sunday, May the 30th, to go to the nations right here in our own city. As the nations are coming to us, the nations have become our neighbors. God has made his move, he's waiting on us to make our move. You're a member of his family. He's given you the opportunity to live a life that will impact eternity. Fruit that lasts forever. What will you do? You can learn more out there on the foyer as you leave. You can go to the website, livingproof.co slash global. Let's go, church. Let's do this. These are exciting days. The move of God might be greater in my lifetime right now than I've ever seen before. 
I don't want to miss out on one thing that God has written in my book, my biography. Why would you want to miss out on one thing that God has written in your book, your biography? Listen, God wants to use you to impact eternity. And like this woman healed from her sickness of blood, when you're looking for your one, I will promise your one will find you. Jesus, I pray for every person this day in this place, watching online, sitting in this auditorium, that Lord, everyone would find the one as this woman with the issue of blood knew Jesus was the anointed one that could stop the bleeding in her life. Sweet friends, listen, Jesus has the power to stop the bleeding in your life. If you'll stop for him, he'll stop for you. He's chosen you, but will you choose him now too? God, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice that if they do not know with certainty, they are a member of God's family eternally. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. If you're watching online from your living room, listen, if you're in this auditorium, this moment could be the most important moment of your life. It is the one that will define your future. If you're not certain today of your eternal home, I want you to pray with me right now. God will hear your prayer. Like this woman who reached out for Jesus, if you will pray, God will hear your prayer this day. He'll turn around for you and touch your life in an eternal way. Pray this with me. Jesus, go ahead and pray this right now. Jesus, I know that I've sinned, that I cannot get to heaven apart from you. But I believe you died for my sin, that you rose again, that you have the power to redeem me from the sickness of blood and stop the bleeding in my life. And today, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I invite you into my life. Come and clean me up from within. Change me from within. Thank you for forgiving my sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give him the glory?